I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker for today. So introducing Gene Kim. Gene was the CTO of Tripwire, and he's not just a CTO, he was the original author the, who actually coded the original version of Tripwire back in 92, and he's currently working on his third book. He apparently didn't learn his lesson in the first two books. Gene, you're writing a book. Gene is writing a book, When IT Fails, a DevOps Novel. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you Gene Kim. Hi, thank you so much for the uh, introduction, Jim. Uh, my name is Gene Kim. I'll be talking today about an area of passion I've had for about 13 years, which is starting, starting uh, to study a group of high-performing organizations that had the best security, the best compliance, the best operational performance, the best project due date performance. And back in 1999, when I first started studying these organizations, we called them genes of the people with great kung fu. So I had the privilege of being able to study these organizations uh, back when I was the CTO of Tripwire. Um, and I'd like to share with you some of my key learnings and how this has converged on rugged DevOps. And maybe just to set the context, what I'd first like to do is just share with you uh, what these high performers uh, were all about. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, sort of genes of the people with great kung fu. These are people who led these high performing IT organizations. And one of the things that we noticed 13 years ago was that you know, they talked differently, acted differently, but the most important part was they had profoundly different operational results and outcomes than your typical IT organization. They, were, they came from one of three professions. They were either a non-commissioned officer in the military, they were a chemical engineer, or they were an auditor, right? Not just any bean uh, counting, green eye shade wearing auditor, they were an IT auditor, right? So can anyone speculate or hypothesize what these three professions have in common in terms of their values? of these professions, non-commissioned officers in the military, chemical engineers, and auditors. Anybody? Discipline. 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 I love that. Right. That's a great word. Uh, any other words come to mind? I'm sorry? I got discipline. Any other words? Process. Good, good. Any others? Attention to detail. You, you got it all, right? So the words that we chose were rigor and discipline, right? Why? Non-commissioned officers give uh, ammunition to 18-year-olds. Right, and I learned in restaurant operations that they don't even like giving uh, knives to 18 year olds, right, because you combine knives and raw carrots, so you get accidents rates so high that insurance companies get involved. Chemical engineers have long, elaborate recipes where, you know, if you miss sequence two steps, endothermic can become exothermic. And then auditors, they just love controls. So uh, that's what led to, uh, uh, you know, uh, over benchmarking over 1,500 organizations. Uh, I helped raise over a million dollars for an organization called the IT Process Institute, really trying to link controls with performance. We uh, benchmarked over 1,500 organizations, really trying to figure out what, what specific controls you know, uh, we could attribute you know, to these phenomenally different outcomes. But uh, you know, what I've found in this journey is that there's actually something terrifying happening in information security. That, uh, where this journey has led me is into straight into the heart of the DevOps movement, which I think uh, exposes some of the largest problems that we have as a profession and some of the largest business challenges that uh, we have uh, in the world. So what I'd like to do is share with you a story in four acts. First, the first act really begins with operations, right? So if you're in IT operations, if you've done a time in, uh, as an ops guy, right, you maybe have been put in situations where you are maintaining a very uh, significant business application or uh, you're working on a project that has a significant amount of uh, uh, you know, business emphasis on. Right, and you know, the problem is that these things tend to get fragile, right? And so the reason why we call it fragile is that we're, these things are breaking all the time, right? Someone looks at it wrong, it breaks and blows up, and it takes a long time to figure out what went wrong, right, in order to restore service. Uh, one of the sort of uh, uh, embarrassing parts about fragile applications is that we're always the last people to find out about it. In other words, you know, the detective uh, control, right, the, the monitoring mechanism that actually told us there was an outage isn't uh, a monitoring control, right? It's actually a salesperson calling, uh, calling me up and saying, hey, Gene, you know, why are all the banner ads in my market being served upside down in Spanish, right? What happened? And then when there's so many moving parts, when, there's a, uh, when the application is sufficiently complex, it always takes a very long time to figure out which bit got flicked, uh, right? And that, that's what we need to undo in order to restore service. Um, so when you have genuinely significant business applications that are fragile, something else happens, is that the business starts missing uh, the commitments it makes to the outside world, right? So sometimes it's letting customers down, sometimes it's uh, commitments to make to analysts, sometimes it's commitments to make to Wall Street. And so when these things happen, something very, very bad happens, even worse than uh, fragile applications, is that the business starts making even more, even larger, more audacious commitments to Wall Street, right? Often dreamed up by these people, right? The product managers, right? Who 
you know, are often creative writing majors, art majors, right, who don't necessarily have the best idea of what technology can and can't do. Right? And by the way, let me just state for the record, some of my best friends are art majors. Right? Uh, they're, they're fine people, but you know, these are often not the best people to uh, be setting commitments to the outside world in terms of what you know, the, the roadmap of the company is going to look like. So when that happens, we enter Act 3, which are the developers. So the developers, right, now they start seeing urgent, date-driven projects put into the queue, right, where a commitment has already been made to the outside world. And when that happens, right, we have to start taking even more shortcuts. Right? And so uh, that means you know, uh, the operational requirements are never fully addressed, and certainly that means that the security requirements are going to be the last to be addressed. And so that means even more fragile applications, even more technical debt. And then, you know, I love the word technical debt. Right? Technical debt, uh, you know, to me, the, the image it conjures up is this. Right? Technical debt is you know, all the things that weren't done quite right because all the corners we took, either in the development, testing, or in the operations process, or certainly in the security and hardening process. And the reason why I call it debt is that debt compounds, right? So that this eventually becomes this, right? You know, uh, you think it can't get worse, and then it does. One of the things that th I've seen over and over again is that it's not just not fragile applications become more fragile. Something else even more insidious starts happening is that applications start taking longer to deploy, right? So applications that used to take, you know, an hour to deploy takes three hours, takes a day, takes a weekend, which is Okay, right? Because you know, at least we can work you know throughout the weekend to get things deployed. Then it says taking three days, right? Which means that now we can no longer do it in the weekend. It takes a week, it takes two weeks. There was a specific uh, project I was working on where an, a deployment took six weeks and over 1,300 steps to actually deploy, right? And when that happens, releases start slowing down, right? Uh, and suddenly, you know, uh, uh, feature uh, deployment intervals start lengthening. So you know that you have a problem, right? Uh, when the deployments become so burdensome, so complex, is that the business says we need to lengthen the deployment intervals, right? In other words, we have to amortize the cost of deployments, you know, to make it uh, because it's so painful, which may go against everything you believe in, right? Because everything that we've learned in manufacturing says we have to shrink batch sizes. You want to shorten the deployment intervals, right? And when you lengthen the deployment intervals, things go the wrong way. Uh, and so when this happens, right? When these deployments get more and more complex. Right, you have even more moving pieces, more fragility, and then enter Act Four. Now you have full-blown warfare between the operations people and the developers, right? And so the expression on the developers' face is like, "Hey, we committed the code. You know, good job, right? We're going home." And the operations people are saying, "But you, you know, you set the whole data center on fire for the entire weekend, right? And caused us, you know, 40 uh, person hours of unplanned work, right?" So then enter Act Five, which is information security, right? Is that you know, IT is not an all-you-can-eat buffet. Right, by the time this happens, there's nothing left for information security. Right? All of the hardening guidelines that we put in, all of the uh, security remediation tasks, right, all of those are now on the backlog. And we have a feeling that, that we're never going to get these fixed. Right? When these things happen, you know, uh, this is when everybody in the IT organization, whether you're in product management, development, ops, or information security, we all feel trapped in a system that preordains failure. Right? That we are powerless to change the outcomes. Mm -hmm. right? and uh, the business is actually going to lose as a result. By the way, how many people here can resonate with any elements of this story? Yeah? So that's interesting, right? Yeah, so for me, this is the downward spiral in five acts that I think actually occurs in every IT organization just as a side effect of how we're organized. And let me just sort of paint this case. You know, uh, there's a school of thought in the theory of constraints that says this is a, uh, that this is a core chronic conflict, that this will occur because we have sort of two simultaneously um, you know, two business needs that result in two diametrically opposed goals, right? In other words, you have your VP of development who's, uh, you know, uh, compensated or motivated to respond quickly to urgent business needs, right? Which means ship as many features as you can, right? On the other hand, you have the uh, VP of operations or the head of security saying we have to create a stable, secure, and reliable IT environment, which means make no changes ever, right? No, make no changes over my dead body, right? Which I've learned can quickly be arranged. Right? And so this is where you end up with um, you know, these core chronic conflicts. And yet, you know, we know that there's a better way. And I'll, I'll share with you why I think DevOps is that way. Uh, just in terms of uh, painting significance, I think this is an important problem because every company, every organization, regardless of what business they think they're in, is actually an IT company. Right? And here's the numbers that really should bear this out for me. One is that 95% of all capital projects involve IT in some way, and that 50% of capital spending is technology related. Right, so this is every organization, large or small, regardless of what industry, profit, not for profit, right, you're going to see these characteristics so that IT is a core competency. And I think another indicative um, evidence point is that 
you know, regardless of where an organization is versus where we want to go, IT is always in the way, right? We're sort of constipating, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the digestive tract of the organization, right? So there must be a better way. And uh, this is where my journey has taken me, which is straight in the heart of the DevOps movement. So let me give you a quick uh, primer on what DevOps is. And in fact, I'm so delighted there's a, a rugged DevOps track. I'll be going to almost all those. Uh, I'm going to go to as many talks as those as I can. So the DevOps movement actually probably got kicked off uh, in... 2009 at the Velocity Conference, which is actually one of my favorite conferences to go to. And, and so uh, John Ospa and Paul Hammond, uh, they were the head of operations and the head of engineering at Flickr and Yahoo. They gave a talk that said, we're doing 10 deploys a day, right? And this is in a, oh, so people were basically fainting in the aisleways, right? Saying 10 deploys a day, right? This is in a world where most organizations are doing not, you know, one deploy every nine months or maybe one deploy every year. I suspect that if uh, these guys had given a talk at, um, uh, at AppSec USA three years ago, you know, here would have been our reaction, right? That's irresponsible, that's wrong, right? You know, that's immoral, right? But essentially what they were saying is that by dev and ops working together, they were getting outcomes that uh, no one else was seeing. In fact, it's so far surpassed what we defined as high performance, I mean, it was literally shocking to me. And what they were saying is that dev and ops are very different disciplines, right? They kind of characterized uh, dev as Spock, you know, being able to sit on the bridge next to Captain Kirk while ops is relegated to the basement. Right, and uh, you know, whenever uh, you know, Captain Kirk says, Scotty, we need warp speed, Scotty's always saying, no, we can't do it, Captain. Right, uh, and yet, you know, uh, if you can get ops people who think like developers and developers who think like ops people, you can not only create a torrid summer of love, right, but you can get outcomes right, that, uh, that, are gen that genuinely help the business win. Right, and by the way, you may be asking, you know, where's information security, right? Um, kind of in my mind, information security, we're that guy. Right? <laughs> we were the first to be taken out in the away team. And you know, um, uh, when I wrote the book uh, Visible Off Security, you know, uh, the words that we came up to sort of characterize kind of uh, our honest, unflinching kind of characterization of our profession, we said, yeah, we're the shrill, hysterical people that everyone avoids because we suck the will to live out of everybody we touch, uh, and we're perceived as you know, the bureaucracy that slows everybody down. Right? So, but that's actually not true. Right? Um, so uh, one last note about DevOps is that you know, DevOps is actually waiting for us with open arms, right? There was another talk at the Velocity Conference, uh, and by the way, this is where uh, organizations like Twitter, uh, Pinterest, Google, they all hang out to share how they're doing what they're doing, which is incredible code you know, achievements and also stability uh, you know, and, and security. Theo Schlossnagel uh, said DevOps is actually a terrible name, right? He says it's incomplete, it's prone to misinterpretation, it's isolated. Right? It really should be called Star Ops. And so what does he mean by Star Ops? He said, well, maybe it's actually more technically correct, dot star ops, right? Or actually more pedantically, every department ops, right? Because where is QA? Where is information security? Where is network engineering, right? Those are all the disciplines you actually need to get fast feature flow and you know, stability and reliability and security in the operations environment. So DevOps was actually a place that we thought was a, just a tremendous cultural fit. Um, you know, and it, we actually have shared values with information security. And I think one of the first people who actually sort of zeroed in on this uh, were three people, I think two of which are here, Josh Corman, uh, who's currently at Akamai, uh, Jeff Williams, and then David Wright. And what they said is that what we need is a better way, right? Now, let's see if we can actually create the rugged computing uh, manifesto that sort of aspires to what every dev developer actually wants, right? And one I, th I think is just one of the most clever sort of sleight of hands I've seen is uh, what they call the rugged attributes. And James Wickett uh, put, this slide, uh, put this slide together. He said, the rugged attributes, right? Every developer, every operations person wants things that are available, defensible, securable, you know, with longevity and portability, right? So a developer would call this the non-functional requirements. In other words, those requirements that aren't just features, right? And if we can actually get cloak the information security requirements as non-functional requirements, wonderful things happen. And I can say after three years of research studying the DevOps community, you know, this is absolutely true, right? There's actually one other insight I'd like to share before I share with you some specific prescriptive patterns that you can actually put into place, uh, you know, in regards of what kind of organization you're working in. One of the things that we found when we studied high performers is that high performers typically tend to accelerate away from the herd. In other words, the best get better. And so uh, three years ago, 10 deploys a day was shocking, uh, right, and was, you know, generally viewed as a business, you know, competitive advantage. These days, I don't think, uh, you know, that's considered pedestrian. Right? Amazon has went on record saying that they are not doing 10 deploys a day. They're doing a deploy every 11 seconds. Right? They will actually peak uh, doing 1,000 deployments in an hour. Right? And that could be as small as a configuration change 
or a full rollout, right? And so, um, you know, I think the reason why this is so important to me is that, you know, uh, were I to do another startup, I would never do it without using DevOps like principle. Because if I'm doing one deploy every nine months, right, and my competitor can do 10 deploys a day, not only can they beat me to market every time, but they can also out experiment me. In other words, they can do A-B testing all day long, right, and uh, you know, with a cycle time of one day, right, whereas it would take me nine months you know, to actually iterate to the next loop. So fast is not always good, right? The goal of DevOps is not just high deploy rates, right? That's an easily visible characteristic of it, right? The, the goal is to win in the marketplace, but fast doesn't equal, necessarily equal better, right? And I think one of the best examples is the Dropbox failure. Right, where someone noticed, that it was actually a customer who noticed that Dropbox authentication services were actually turned off for four hours, right? And so here was an example where operations, security, and development were all asleep at the wheel, right? Now you can sort of imagine how this happened. You know, I can imagine, right, that it was a developer who forgot to turn off a debug flag or, you know, they forgot to sort of turn off the configuration setting, right, and that pushed into production. And that should have never, ever happened, right? And so as we are looking at, uh, you know, these DevOps style work streams, our goal is to make sure that we can keep up with those high deploy rates and, you know, uh, there should never be an excuse where uh, an organizational jeopardizing uh, risk like this ever comes into being. So I'm going to share with you uh, the three ways, these are the three principles that uh, we believe underpin DevOps and then the prescriptive patterns that you can actually derive from them. Um, and the, why, why am I doing this? Um, if I could wave a magic wand, you know, everyone here will be able to, one, be conversant with DevOps and recognize the practices and the patterns when you see them. Two is, you know, actually be energized about how information security practitioners can contribute uh, in this journey, right? Because my genuine belief is that this is actually one of the most important, significant things uh, and one of the best things to happen to information security in the last 30 years. And I'll be able to leave with some concrete steps to get these incredible outcomes, to replicate these outcomes. And then, you know, maybe most importantly is be a part of a team, you know, whether they're in dev, op, in dev or ops or QA or network engineering that actually starts putting these um, practices into place and get outcomes like they've never had before and be a part of that team. So the first of the three ways uh, is all about systems thinking. It's really as you go from uh, dev to ops, left to right, right? And so why dev and ops? It's because dev and ops are what's between the business and the customer, right? So the business defines requirements, that becomes working process for dev, then which flows to operation, and that's where actually value is created. If it's not in production, no value has actually been created, right? And so the platitudes and principles that uh, are behind the first way include understanding the flow of work, right, as we go from left to right. And I think one of the big, uh, I think, points uh, for me is that work only goes in one way. Whenever we see work going backwards, that's a problem. Two is not only do we want not not only do we want work not to go backwards, we want to always seek to increase flow, right? So uh, all the practitioners around lean or theory constraints, right? They have a whole bunch of uh, techniques, you know, used to, uh, that we can use to actually increase flow primarily, which is decreasing batch sizes. I'll talk about uh, how we do that. The third is how do we never unconsciously pass defects on downstream? In other words, um, you know, if you look at, uh, probably one of the best examples of this is the Toyota Andon cord which is where if you're in a Toyota assembly line, in fact, I think I have a picture of this. Nope. Um, uh, I have a Toyota picture of this later, is that you know, it's actually better to stop the entire production plant uh, than it, uh, that's actually what they do 100 times a day, right? Because that's far better than actually allowing technical debt to accrue downstream. And you, know, you can't do any of this without really achieving what Deming would call a profound understanding of the system. So uh, the first pattern that comes out of this um, really came from this statement. Uh, is, uh, a friend of mine, his name is Ben Rockwood. He's a director of systems engineering at Joint. So he actually owns the engineering resources for ops and a considerable chunk of the information security responsibilities for Joint, a cloud services provider. He said annual business planning sessions can be maddening. They think IT is an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? And so one of the things that he reflected back at me was uh, this practice. He said, you know, in order to uh, even talk about the flow of work, you must first define work. And he said, there's four types of work that you'd find in When IT Fails, a, um, a DevOps novel. He said, the first is business projects, right? So that's, that's one that the product managers and the business people that talk about. But what they often don't see is that often atomizes into internal projects. So these are the infrastructure improvement projects. These are the deployments. These are all the things that IT has to do in order to enable or uh, the business project to actually get to the customer. Uh, internal projects often atomize into changes. Um, and then the, the fourth one, which is probably the most important one, is the unplanned work, right? These are all the things that IT is doing 
you know, as a result of failures, service incidents, security breaches, right? And you know, the goal is always to reduce the amount of unplanned work. You know, most organizations probably spend half the time on unplanned work, often as a result of technical debt, right? So the goal here is to make this visible, right, and show how we can actually uh, aid in the improvement of getting these things done and the eradication of these things. So that's the first thing. Make sure work is visible. Make sure things only, oh, and whenever, whenever work goes backwards, right, that's unplanned work. So that's practice number one. Practice number two uh, derives from this need. Is like, you know, this is the problem where the developers uh, get together with the product managers in a uh, conference room and they say, we're shipping next week, right? And information security and ops freak out because, you know, the application is not even uh, designed to run. Right? You know, how can we deploy it next week? You know, we haven't done capacity testing. We haven't finished the pen test. We haven't done the vulnerability scanning. Right? Uh, you know, so how do we do that? And I would say to be more um, clear about the problem, the problem here is that the developers have used up all the time in the schedule, leaving no time for the people at the end. Right? That includes information security and operations. So there's a second pattern here is designed to mitigate this. The goal here is to create a one-step environment creation process so we can make env environments available as early in the development process as possible. So what is the environment? The env environment is everything besides the code. Operating system, databases, right, uh, the networking parts, the virtualization layer, right, everything except for the code. Um, and so ideally, right, um, you know, you can't get to 10 deploys a day without having a one-step deployment creation process. And the goal here is to actually um, build the dev, QA, and production environments all at the same time. Right, so that means that dev has a dev environment that's consistent and stable, that has some shot at being uh, able to be run in the production environment, um, you know, in a way that is characterizable and predictable. Um, but there's actually one other change that we need to make, which is, you know, if you're in an agile process, in an agile process, at the end of each sprint, uh, the goal is to have shippable code, right? But we know that's not sufficient. So we've got to change the agile sprint policy so that at the end of each sprint, we must have a working code and the environment it runs in, right? So that means, you know, forever after, right, we'll always be able to deploy without, you know, um, you know having operations security, uh, having no time to have a, uh, an environment. Uh, so in terms of specific things that uh, information security can be, be doing to help enable these steps, is, you know, when there is a, uh, a one-step deploy process, there's typically some tool like Puppet or Chef uh, being used. These are tools that uh, you know, you'll find at Google, at Facebook. It's like, uh, it basically handles all the provisioning after uh, you get uh, the uh, operating system laid down. So we want to find wherever these projects are going on, right, and come to them with all of our hardening guidelines, with all of our checklists, and they will actually thank us for it, right, because you know, what they want is a predictable, stable environment, right, and they're looking for anything that uh, they can get their hands on to actually improve the environment. Right, here's actually where we want to um, integrate our monitoring in. Uh, we, here's where we want to put our certs to find misconfigurations. Um, and another thing that we want to do is just define in advance what changes can actually be pre-approved to go into production versus which change can never go into production without a full review. Like think about the authentication failure Dropbox, right? If someone changes that authentication module, even if it takes four weeks to test, right, that's what we have to do, right? Uh, but let's focus our attention there versus the other changes that, you know, don't have uh, such a risk. So the outcomes that we would expect uh, when you put these uh, practices into place include, you know, a single repository for code and environments, which is great for security because all the artifacts of, uh, are required to actually create the production environment now live in one place that's audible. Uh, we have determinism in the release process. We have consistent dev, QA, and production environments all properly built long before the deployment actually begins. And now we're shrinking the cycle times, right? This is where we can go from six weeks down to a month, down to weeks, and hopefully uh, down to multiple times a day. Um, and by the way, these things are often tasks, not projects. When I was uh, uh, doing a project with the uh, CT of AOL, just by changing who was doing the, pack, the code packaging, we actually de reduced deployment times down from, uh, from six hours down to 45 minutes for the AOL.com property, right? Which was a phenomenal boon to information security because now we had one point of accountability of uh, where code audits could be done. And then this is what leads to a faster release cadence. So that's the first way. So the first way is all about left to right as we go from development to operations. The second way is all about, and by the way, where is information security? It's everywhere, right? It's at every point in the flow, right? Um, so the second way is all about right to left. How do we go from operations to development? How do we create feedback loops, right? So we can prevent 
bad things from happening again and create quality at the source. So the platitudes or the principles that uh, really underpin the second way include understanding and responding to the needs of all customers, internal and external. Right, and the, the point here is that you know, often we're focused on the external customer, but according to the lean thinking, uh, the customer is any downstream step. Right? So any place where we can make life easier for the next step, right? uh, that's something that we need to focus on. We want to shorten and amplify all feedback loops, stopping the line uh, whenever necessary. Um, I talked a little bit about that. And then we want to create quality at the source. So this is a big platitude, but there, there's this is actually, uh, I think one of the best examples of this is designing for manufacturing. You know, in the, uh, uh, in the 1980s, one of the big breakthroughs was when engineering said, hey, our end customer isn't uh, the, end, uh, isn't the uh, person driving the Toyota, it's actually the manufacturing people. We must make it impossible for them to actually misassemble uh, parts, over tighten, you know, and they, uh, they started designing things so that they were actually could be manufactured. That was a primary customer. You know, how do we create that in a DevOps work stream? And we do that by creating and embedding knowledge where we need it. So I talked a little bit before about the Toyota and Don you know, this is, uh, this is it here, or specifically here. Right, uh, this is an uh, ad from, uh, I think, Time Magazine uh, in the 1980s. And basically the expectation is that whenever something goes wrong you know, at a, um, a work center, uh, you pull the cord, right? And so this actually ceases production and allows everybody to swarm the problem. And so what is a problem? A problem, it might be a defect in a part. It could be the step is taking too long, right? It took uh, 28 seconds versus uh, you know, 15 seconds. It means any sort of unacceptable deviance, right? And uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, you know, one of the big shocks to me, I actually learned this only a month ago, is that you know, uh, the question was asked, how many times does an andon cord get pulled in a typical day? And I would have guessed maybe five or 10, and the answer is 100, right? It just shows you know, how uh, much importance they put on that, right? And you know, I think it's all because they focus on the flow. So you know, how do we do that uh, between dev and ops, and how do we inject security into that? One of my favorite quotes is, came from Patrick Lightbody. He was the CEO of a company called BrowserMob. He said, we found that when we woke up developers at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster than ever. Right? I think that's marvelous, right? So the goal here is you know, we want to sort of create fast feedback loops and give developers the information they need so they know the consequences of the decisions they make on a daily basis. And, uh, one of the best ways I found it is actually having developers initially maintain their own service. In other words, never again can they just throw the half-formed pig over the wall and make operation and information security live with the outcomes. And I think one of the best examples of this actually comes from Google. They have something called the HRR, the Handoff Readiness Review. So what it says is that every, uh, inter every application at Google has to be managed by developers for six months before they become even eligible. Uh, for what they call SRE coverage, systems reliability engineering. In other words, operations and security are such a scarce resource, right, that you must clear this hurdle before you become uh, eligible, you know, to tap the SRE core, right? And so what is the HRR? The handoffs revenues review is, you know, we're gonna look at, you know, the frequency of page alerts, the maturity of monitoring, architecture review, release processes. And I, I love this, production hygiene, right? I mean, are you, uh, you know, are, do you have the work habits and the coding habits that can even make you, uh, you know, palatable for you to actually, you know, run in the production environment? And so what happens when someone fails the HRR? What happens if uh, there's actually, they, um, you know, it turns out they are writing fragile code or insecure code? They call it the handback, right? In other words, uh, you lose the ability to actually run in production and tap uh, the SRE core, right? So, yeah, I think this is a great um, pattern of like how you can make sure that developers eat their own dog food before things go into production. And by the way, if you're interested in this, this is, a, uh, this is Tom Limoncelli, uh, who is now at Google, but he wrote a seminal book called uh, The Art of System Administration, which is an O'Reilly book. Um, okay, so specifically, right, um, you know, we want to embed development into operations, right? So, um, uh, so that includes you know, getting dev into the IT operations escalation process, uh, we want to invite dev to all our post-mortem meetings, any sort of security uh, incident um, reviews, right? We want to be, the goal here is to make sure that development can see the consequences of decisions they make, right? And uh, share the pain, right? And uh, we want to have dev and infosec cross-train IT operations, right? So I, know, I think this is kind of an interesting duality. On the one hand, we want to escalate the development more, but anything that we can actually push down into IT operations, we want to push down to the lowest possible levels we can because, you know, um, both operations and information security. Our goal is to create tribal knowledge, not uh, you know, perpetuate individual knowledge. And then uh, we wanna make sure that you know, 
all that we create a one single pane of glass where you can see all the relevant metrics, whether it's operations metrics, development metrics, information security, the business outcomes. See them all in one place because these are the this is the information we need to actually restore service quickly. Um, specific things that information security can do um, is give feedback to developers, right? Being attacked in production is a gift. In fact, I, I took this out of Nick Galbraith's slides, uh, a great presentation he gave. He said, you know, capture all instances of, you know, SQL uh, statements being used in user input form. Graph it and show it to developers, right? Show them on a daily basis. This is a hostile environment which your code is operating in, right? This is what causes behavior changes. Behavior changes is what causes habit changes and culture changes. Right, show all instances of seg faults. Um, I think another sort of very powerful thing we can do is actually create uh, abuse cases, right? So in an agile process, you know, a very powerful tool is you know, uh, user story, so they live above the features, characterizing things from a user perspective. What information security should be doing is create abuser stories, right? So uh, Josh Corman said, hey, a great abuser uh, abuse case is if uh, anonymous DDoS attacks can now sustain uh, peak attacks of four million users and four to six gigabits per second, that should be an abuse case so that uh, we can put that into the backlog so engineers can actually start designing towards that, right? These are how we, you know, actually fulfill the non-functional requirements um, so we can build secure code that's stable, reliable, and, um, um, and can survive attack. Uh, this is a Nick Galbraith slide. Of just showing, hey, here's a, a great way of showing you know, potential SQL injections and showing this on a daily basis. So here are the outcomes you would expect out of doing this. One is that defects and security issues are getting fixed faster than ever, right? By showing developers you know, uh, you know, what things are happening to the code and the consequence of decisions they make. Uh, we are now actually creating a library of ops and infosec user stories that are now part of not just a project we worked on, but then can be reused in every project uh, that now heads towards operations. All groups are communicating and coordinating better, uh, and everyone's getting more work done, right? And ideally here, is now this is where we actually start being able to curb the amount of defects going into production, but uh, you know, we can even do better than that, and that gets to the third way. So the first way was going from dev to ops, left to right. The second way is all about right to left, you know, creating feedback loops from uh, ops into dev. The third way is all about creating a culture of continual experimentation and learning. So what do I mean by that? So we want a culture that simultaneously strives for two things. One is saying that we want to experiment and take risks, and we want to learn from failure, right? But two is we, want to, we need to understand that repetition is a prerequisite to mastery. There's an emerging school of uh, thought that says, whether you're in special forces or learning a musical instrument or tra uh, doing sports training, it is better to practice 15 minutes a day, every day, than it is to practice three hours once a week. Right, and so uh, why is this important? We need a culture that allows us and expects us to keep pushing into the danger zone, but we have to have the habits that enable us to be able to survive and be able to retreat out of the danger zone when we've gone too far, right? And so the, uh, you know, doing one uh, rehearsal of a security breach, right, is not enough, right? And I'll show you kind of what it should look like. Uh, Adrian Cockcroft, he's a cloud architect at Netflix, he said we need to, we want to break things early and often. We want to do painful things more frequently so that we can make them less painful over time. And when we do this, right, uh, by the way, this guy is an ex-system administrator, right, an ex-security person actually, he said we don't get pushback from developers because we know that we're making rollouts smoother for the future, right? And I think one of the best examples of this uh, actually came about, uh, like I think it was on April 22nd, uh, April 21st, right? It was, this is the famous uh, AWS failure where every Amazon customer went down, right? Um, and Josh Corman said, you know, painted such a vivid image for uh, me on this. He said uh, when he was presenting at Source Boston at like 10.30, everyone looked, picked up their phones and then left the room, right? Why? Because every um, um, organization that was dependent on AWS uh, went down, except for one organization, and that was Netflix. Right, and uh, thus came a seminal blog post uh, a couple weeks later that said how they did it. And they said, in order to survive failure, we learned that we had to fail all the time. And that's why we created something called Chaos Monkey. Right, so what Chaos Monkey is, is it runs on every production system in the cloud and randomly kills processes and server instances. <laughs> right. How many people here would love a culture that says, yes, do all your pen tests unscheduled without telling us and do it all the time? How many people here would love that? 
Yeah. So my point here is that in a DevOps style culture, this is what's this is a culture that uh, would, is waiting for you with open arms. Give me the best you've got, right? And so, um, actually, James Wickett is working on a very exciting project called Gauntlet, and uh, they're working on a, a larger uh, uh, number of tools called the like Security Monkey, Compliance Monkey. We're weaponizing uh, this. Is, uh, we're weaponizing Chaos Monkey, right? So that uh, we can actually do testing in production. And by the way, one of the things I just learned six months ago is that yes, Chaos Monkey runs in production. True but it runs also in QA, which is <laughs> at a much higher rate. So before you run Chaos Monkey in production, run it first in test. <laughs> so uh, there are a whole bunch of ways that we can break things in production. We can enforce consistency in the code and the environments and the configurations across all the environments. Uh, we want to add as many asserts as we can, not only in production, but in the deployment pipeline. Uh, this is actually a great place where we can actually do static code analysis and uh, actually integrate this into the continual, uh, continuous develop, that's not CD, continuous uh, deployment processes. And then, you know, what Chaos Monkey really is is fault injection, right? We want to inject fault as early as we can, right? Not just in production, but as early as we can in the development lifecycle. And uh, there's just an exciting no, um, number of tools, Gauntlet included, Security Compliance Monkey. These are all sort of designed to run in this continuous delivery process that uh, can support 10 deploys a day or hundreds of deploys a day. But Chaos Monkey without something else is just chaos, right? What we, what we need to do is actually reserve 20% of our cycles to technical debt reduction. So who would, um, the person who advocates this is a gentleman named Marty Kagan, right? And uh, there, what, he is a cultural hero in the product management space. Uh, and he says this with authority, because, and people believe him because he inherited the product management organization at eBay in 2002. And what he, uh, in 2002, for those of you who don't remember, was a time when eBay was experiencing chronic, you know, monkey year, you know, site down issues, right? And he's saying, if you don't reserve 20% of cycles for technical debt reduction, you will be spending 100% of your cycles on debt reduction, right? Because this becomes that, right? And just imagine why this is so important, right? Is that if you have a, a site down is because of a cabling error between the SAN and the database server, right? Try, you know, imagine trying to find that, right? And so when you have 20% of your cycles re uh, dedicated for uh, debt reduction, you can actually have the uh, collective will to turn this into that, right? It's great for operational stability, it's great for security, it's great for code hardening, but it's also great for deployment times, right? You can't do high deployment right, uh, rates when you have uh, a chaotic operations environment. And I think one of the great hacks I've seen in terms of really enforcing this is when you have a Kanban board or if you have uh, some sort of uh, card system uh, in the Agile process, make all your user features yellow and then make all your debt reduction projects in blue, right? So that means that uh, just at one glance you can see are about 20% of the cards blue and more importantly, are they marching across the board, right? Because you want them not only defined in work, but you also want them in production, right? Because if it's not in production, we haven't actually created value. There's actually one other aspect about um, uh, the third way I want to touch on. In some ways, actually, I think it's actually the most important, especially for the business, is high deployment rates are not just about being able to deploy features faster. <laughs> um, Gene is talking too fast. Sorry, guys. Um, this actually came from Scott Cook, uh, the founder of Intuit. Uh, he said, by installing what he calls a rampant innovation cu culture, we were able to do 165 experiments in the peak um, three months of the tax. So this is the TurboTax property. So when I first uh, saw this, you know, uh, I almost fell on my chair. I said, what sort of idiot would do 165 major changes in the middle of peak filing, tax filing season, right? Most retailers don't even touch production from Halloween till January, right, because the outage risk is so high, right? So why would they do that? He said, because of those experiments, we were actually able to increase the conversion rate of the website by 50%, right? So in other words, they were actually able to steal customers from the competition that otherwise they would have had to wait a year uh, to be able to recapture, right? So uh, the, by doing constant A-B testing, by being able to support high deploy rates and simultaneous uh, deployments, you can actually create compet incredible business advantage by doing this, right? So great for operations, great for security, and also great for the business. So the outcomes of uh, putting the third way into practice are technical debt is finally being paid off. Now for the first time, we're seeing the exploitable attack surface area decrease, 
right, because we've uh, bitten off those hard projects and those major refactoring projects so we actually can actually make those problems go away. We're continually reducing the amount of unplanned work, which means more cycles for planned work. Um, we have more resilient code environments, and we know this because we're testing and injecting faults both in dev, test, and production all, all the time. And we're allowing a faster tempo of experimentation and a quicker time to market, uh, right? And by the way, one of the things that I think is just so amazing, right, is that you know, when you have this sort of discipline in place, right, you can find and fix security issues faster than ever, right? No longer do we have to wait nine months for the next deploy window, right? We can fix things in line. So uh, you know, the, the six patterns for the three, uh, that come from the three ways, define the work, make it visible, make those environments available early, Right, that comes in the first way. Wake up developers as uh, often as we can, right? Uh, but also may, uh, put them, embed them in the IT operations organization where it makes sense. Third way, break things early and often, and make sure that we're reserving 20% for the uh, paying down of technical debt, right? This is what helps development, uh, operations, and security win. But more importantly, you know, the business will see the value of this. This is how we actually you know, get fast time to market. This is how we can actually uh, beat the competition, both in time to market and experimentation. But more importantly, I think this is what it feels like. Right? This is the feeling of like, ah, oh, hey, we finally got those important projects done. But I love this picture even more. It's like, hey, thank you, information security. You helped the business win. Thank you for keeping the auditors away. Thank you for making sure that these uh, repeat audit issues never come up. Thank you for um, you know, uh, taking the backlog of security issues and making it all go away, making the environment more secure and more resilient. And then this picture is even better than that, right? This is a one of inclusion. This is information security being invited to the deployment party for the first time ever, right? Saying, hey, those security guys are great, right? Let's invite them again on the next release too. And I'm not sure if anyone actually gets to do more with less these days, but we can all do more with less effort, right? Uh, you know, and I think that, to me, speaks to something even more urgent than that, right? When I talk about the downward spiral, you know, it, to me, it's actually disturbing that the downward spiral happens in almost every IT organization, large or small, regardless of what industry, uh, profit or nonprofit. And to me, that's actually the most important problem of all, right? Is that when we are trapped in a system that makes us feel powerless, that preordained failure, that uh, makes us feel trapped in a system that we can't escape, that actually does damage to us as human beings, right? And uh, when you live in a system like that, year after year, right? These are the problems that we take home. Josh Corman uh, and uh, Jack Daniel, they did a study that said the rate of burnout in the information security industry is some of the highest you know, in any job vocation, right? Including law enforcement, right? And I think these are the things that, uh, you know, our family, they feel that too. So, you know, to be able to break that terrible cycle, you know, it just has, you know, I think it has tremendous value just in terms of, uh, for us as a profession, but also I think it has incredible business value as well. One of uh, my co-authors, uh, Mike Orzen, we actually did a calculation that said, how much business value is there on the table for us to recapture? If we could have the amount of waste that's associated with DevOps style problems and information security problems, and could redeploy that in a way where we could get five times the value? The answer is $3 trillion, right? That is a huge number. That is more than the entire economic output of Germany, right, per year. So imagine what that would do to productivity, Imagine what that can do to standard of living, and for me, most importantly, imagine what that does to, for the world you know, that our kids will inherit. You know, I think this is a phenomenal opportunity, a phenomenal problem that needs to be solved, and a phenomenal opportunity. So uh, I had stated before, if I could wave a magic wand, everyone will be conversant with DevOps patterns and recognize them when you see them. I hope that you're energized about what DevOps can do for us as an information security practitioner and show how it can radically change the outcomes. I hope that you can uh, got some concrete steps that you can actually put into organizations, whether you're a consultant or uh, you know an employee. And then you know I really hope that you can be a part of a team that actually puts this into place because, as uh, as I mentioned before, right, they are waiting for us with open arms, and we have a lot to offer. And I'm looking forward for you uh, to actually experience that yourself. Uh, there's I'm working on two books right now. Uh, the one coming out next is When IT Fails, a DevOps novel. Uh, which has um, been one of the most rewarding and fulfilling uh, projects I've worked on in my life. And so uh, we created an organization called IT Revolution Press, and our goal is to positively impact the lives of a million IT workers in the next five years. And so if you're interested in these slides, uh, if you want a, um, a paper called The Top 11 Things You Need to Know About DevOps, 
If you want uh, the rugged DevOps resources and updates on the book, if you want any of those things, just uh, you can just pick up your phone and uh, text your email address and the number 75894 to the number on your screen, or you can go to this URL and just type in your uh, uh, name and email address. And I, sorry about the name requirement; that was a uh, fat finger on my part. But anyway, uh, just put in your email address, all right, and you'll get those sent to you instantly. Uh, or you can also sign up um, at itrevolution.com or email me at Gene K at uh, realgenesim.me. Thank you so much, I appreciate the time, and I hope you got some value out of this presentation. Thanks.